never let somebody tell you you can't do something. Wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. You're listening to the Live to Create podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash live to create. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the official Live to Create podcast coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. I am your host, Shane Almgren, and I am joined today from Nashville by Emmy-winning TV director and producer Steve Feldman. Steve has worked with talent as varied as Bill Nye, the science guy, Linda Ellerby, Bill Maher, and Elmo for PBS, CBS, Disney, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Comedy Central, MSNBC, and Discovery. His work on Sesame Street earned him an Emmy Award, while his work with Barney and Friends, The Wubulous World of Dr. Seuss, The Nick News, and The Christopher Lowell Show contributed to nine other Emmy Awards and nominations. Steve's credits include Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher, Lazy Town, and the debut musical theater production for Walden Media, Rock Odyssey. Mr. Steve, it is an honor to have you on the show. Thanks for joining me today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. You've got quite a diverse resume. You've got the main things. You've got Barney. You've got Sesame Street. You've got uh, Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher, two of which are very, very family-friendly. One, Barney, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Barney, not family-friendly? Come on now. Um, which, of, which of those were your favorites to work on? You know, I get asked that question a lot. It's a tough one because um, um, I really do love the diversity of programs that I've worked on. And I think that uh, I I less have a favorite show than I do um, have a a real love of just collaborating with a lot of creative people. It's it's one of the fun things about film and television is that uh, uh, you're you're not the only artist on the block. You're uh, surrounded by uh, a lot of other people who uh, are as uh, if not more and generally more important to the production than you are so it's really fun i I have to say as a team um the sesame street team was really quite extraordinary and really fun to work with and i think what was particularly interesting about that is that you know the part of their claim to fame is that uh, they they have uh, they have been a favorite of celebrities and celebrities love to come on the show they come on the show and and work for a union scale uh, just to just to be on the on the program and they're always fascinated by the pro- process of working with puppets and all the characters and all the history at Sesame Street so you're surrounded by all these incredible people puppeteers and, and uh, cameramen and, and women and uh, graphics people and it's a set designers. It's a huge production, and uh, everybody loves what they're doing. And it, it honestly is like one big playtime on the set. So uh, that would have to be the favorite uh, uh, ever for me. Now, how did you end up there? Uh, I was a, a pain in the butt. I uh, basically uh, called the that time um, actually Lisa Simon, who was the executive producer and actually had been a director there. Um, but she was executive producer, and uh, I just bugged her constantly. And she uh, eventually called me up. She says, "Okay, so you'll stop calling. All right, come on down and let's have a meeting." <laughs> so, did you did you have an actual skill set that you could offer them, or did you just want to be around Elmo? I, uh, you know, it, you know, I was not attracted to Elmo at the beginning, but I learned to love him. But the the uh, the character it was developed by a gentleman named Kevin Clash, and he was just a genius, a genius puppet and he became my favorite puppeteer uh, pretty much to work with but uh, I'm, I'm really above all I, I w- I've always been a big fan of Telly uh, which is uh, Telly Monster who was uh, done by uh, Marty, yeah, Marty I love Telly I love Telly he's got that nervous look on his face and it's all in the eyes it's just how they set the eyes and you know when you look at Marty Robinson Mar- uh, who's, uh, who's the puppeteer who has always done Telly he kind of looks the same way so it's interesting um, so I always loved working with I actually I worked with Marty on a couple of other uh, uh, shows, um, so um, he's probably been that that particular character was my favorite one. Do the puppeteers also do the voice, or is that provided by somebody else? Yes, no, they do. They do the voice, and that's part of what makes it a special art. Is that these uh, these folks are. 
you know, when you think about uh, The Muppet Show and you think about uh, Sesame Street and then there's a couple of others, you know, this is a very small uh, club of, of world-class puppeteers. So the realization for me is, in working at Sesame Street is that you're working with a group of people who are, uh, you know, some of the best in the world. And that in itself is an awesome, uh, even more than awesome, it's a, kind of a shock to the system to realize that you're working with uh, people of this world class. And they're just amazingly talented. They have great physical skills, as well as combining that with uh, being great actors and, and great comedians. They, they All of this stuff uh, mixes up in their performance. So uh, they do it all, and they're very, very talented. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough job. It's a tough job, and they're very, very good at it. Where do world class puppeteers hang out? Like I know when Cirque du Soleil is casting, they they go get their gymnasts from like Olympic caliber uh, world class gymnasts. Where are the puppeteers uh, conglomerating? Well, you'll never know when you're walking near somebody who either is a puppeteer, has been one, or would like to be one. Uh, I, um, you know, where do we all hang? They they're mostly in New York and L.A. There's a large community in London. In this uh, country, Atlanta has actually one of the finest uh, puppet uh, kind of workshop slash uh, schools in the country. Um, so you'll find them mostly in big cities or where there's ways for them to make a living. Um, and so that yeah, that's where they are primarily. Uh, England and BBC uh, through BBC, they have a very uh, and also Henson used to have an office in England. In fact, I think he still does, or the company still does. They have a large community in uh, in England. When you were on set, so you're you're directing Sesame Street, correct? Yes, sir. That's what I was doing. How? <laughs> I'm just wondering if there's ever an instance where, I, I mean, when you're directing people, do you are you talking to the puppets? Do you ever get confused about which character you're supposed to be interacting with? <laughs> yeah, maybe first thing in the morning, but no, you you wake up pretty quickly. Um, no, not really. I think that um, yeah, I. I and, and actually, when I come over to talk to them, uh, the only time they'll just keep the puppet on is if they just want to have some fun with me, you know. So uh, so I'll walk over to tell Marty something and Telly will look at me and go, really? I don't understand what you're saying. So uh, <laughs> so those, uh, th that will happen. But generally, uh, they, they put the puppet down and you speak, you speak to them right there. And it's a very, very close uh, collaborative uh, experience for them and me. I just love it. I mean, so to the point where I was the first director on set Street. I'll, I'll take I'll take credit for this. At least in my my recollection, the directors used to work from the control room, and then they'd come out and talk. But I just had a hard time doing that. So I enjoyed uh, being on set during every take, so that I could get a sense of of what was going on physically with them, the problems they may have been having with my direction. And you're just in much much closer proximity. It's like you know, it's like a movie. You you want to be close to the action so that you can actually see uh, how it's working for the uh, for the actors. So um, I said they set me up a console right up uh, right on set. I had a little monitor and three monitors showing the three cameras that we were using. And I used to call the show, in other words, call live, switch the show from the set, calling out instructions to my assistant director inside the control room. So it was really great, and uh, that's what's fun. Now every director works on the set. Every single director on the show works on the set, and and has, and you know, that's that's the way. That's kind of the rule now, rather than the exception. And you set that precedent. <laughs> I guess I did because when I asked for it, they, everybody looked at me and they said, really, you want to be on the set? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, sure, we can make that happen. I, I don't recall while I was there anyone who was doing that. And I know before me, there may have been somebody, but I never heard of it. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that after, uh, by the time I left, a lot of them were working on set. And everybody would admit it's so much easier to do the show on set when you're, you have that kind of proximity rather than being in the control room. So, yeah, I'll take credit for it. You know, if somebody wants to dispute that, that's okay. I would love to uh, shake the hand of the person who actually, you know, actually directed that way anyway. So, it'd be fun. We can have a party. How long does it take to do a full episode of Sesame Street? Well, as you know, Sesame Street has got a lot of different episodes or different segments mixed into it. Uh, you know, we would do the the actual story part, uh, 
in one shooting day, and then we might do a couple of extra segments, uh, but generally one shooting day to get enough material that would fit into an episode. Um, although some of the things you would do would go into two or three episodes. You know, that's just the nature. But the day was not long either. It was a relatively, I think it was a 10 hour day, so it was pretty, it was pretty uh, standardized and, um, and fairly relaxed. And, uh, and then that was the environment, you know, we needed to work fast, um, because people, you know, people get tired after 10 hours and the puppeteers particularly work very hard. They're, they're lying around in all kinds of bizarre positions that, uh, you know, and they have their arms straight up in the air for long periods of time. And it's, uh, it's, it's a strenuous, uh, effort for them. So yeah, you want to, you want to keep the day at a, at a reasonable length. Who was inside the big bird costume? Was that a really tall person or was that stilts in there or what was going on? trade secrets i don't know if i can give you um but uh, carol spinney was inside the costume he was a uh, normal height he was about uh i think carol was about six feet maybe a little shorter but the a lot of things are operated from you know below there's all kinds of controls and he, he does the arms and i think controls the mouth another way but he's no he's not i don't believe he's on stilts as far as i as far as i remember he's not on stilts but i could be wrong about that i've never been inside the big bird suit what about Snuffle Up? I guess uh, are there how many people are in there? Two people. <laughs> Snuffy has two people. Unfortunately, we don't see Snuffy anymore, which is a sad thing. So I don't think they use that puppet much. They may bring him on from time to time, but it's not. Uh, he's not out there. They've tried to limit the characters right now, you know. And I'm sure that Big Bird misses him because they were best friends. I heard about a certain Christmas party where there may or may not have been more than two people inside of Snuffle Up. I guess that's true. That's true. Um, boy, I'll get in a lot of trouble for this, but that's okay. <laughs> I, I presume I'm, you I'm, want me to tell the story. Oh, I would you, love for you <laughs> out with it, Steve. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, you know, anybody who gets offended by this, send your letters to. Uh, you can. Well, I won't give my address out. At any rate, um, send them to yeah, me. I'll, I'll take the heat. He'll take the heat. Shane will take the heat. Okay, good, 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 good. Well, we have these extraordinary Christmas parties every year at Sesame Street where there's a lot of food and a lot of just fun. And uh, and the tradition, uh, and again, I don't know that this tradition is still going on, but the tradition was the entire time I was there and went back years is that the puppeteers would put on their own Christmas show that, that they would write and perform and direct and the whole thing they would do it and uh, one year we had this so they do these sketches and um what would generally happen at these uh, things is that these shows would be pretty much pg-13 rated or maybe even sometimes r-rated but uh knowing that the staff would always come with their children and uh to, to watch the show and to be there at the party and i guess some people weren't aware of what they might see and who knows for all i know they don't do this anymore but they used to and uh, snuffy comes out at the front end of the show and he's with big bird and you know the two friends are together and they're kind of gabbing back and forth and all of a sudden uh, snuffy starts to cough and he goes so uh, it just kind of goes and uh, that's all. And then they, you know, he coughs again, and Big Bird asks him, you okay? You okay? He says, yeah, yeah, I just got something stuck in my throat, you know? And he's just, but then he starts to really cough heavily and loudly, and then he starts to retch. And uh, <laughs> ultimately, he opens his mouth and he throws up, like he throws up, a live kid that's inside of him. <laughs> So you're looking, you're looking at around the room, and and parents are covering their kids' eyes. Everybody is horrified, and then the other half of the audience is just on the floor laughing, and that's it. And the kid gets up and just brushes himself off and walks away. And then Stuffy will look out and go, "Oh, I feel better now," and that's it. So, um, you which know, half of the audience did you fall on? I had no kids there, so I was, uh, I was, I, I really enjoyed it. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, you're, you, when, when, if you don't know what to expect, and you never do with these guys, they come up with this stuff in secret. Um, if you don't know what to expect, then it's just a shock, and, but then, then it's just hilarious. You just, it, it made, I don't know who thought of it, but it's very, very funny. And, and those, those are the earmarks of the Christmas show. Every year, there's, a, there's several instances, actually, where you're kind of going, whoa, okay, okay, you've never seen a puppet do that before. So um, it's fun. It's really fun, and it's a good way for them to let off steam and, uh, and uh, you know, because, again, these guys are very, 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 very talented and creative. They have all sorts of ideas, 
and uh, they, they, they love doing Sesame Street. They love to bring their ideas to the table, but these are the level of ideas that they, you know, they obviously can't do on a kid's show. So they stretch their adult wings a little bit. So are the puppeteers and the people doing the voices, are they involved in the writing on the show? Well, some of the puppeteers have been writers. I mean, actually, um, and he unfortunately just left the show, but Joey Mazzarino, who was one of my favorite puppeteers and a great guy, um, he was the head writer. Was the head writer. Uh, this past year, and he was still a puppeteer. Or for for a few years, he was been the head writer, but he just left the show, and so I'm not sure who the head writer is now. But but there are um, there are there have been instances. We also do a lot of writing on the set because you know we we get the set. It's a pretty intense schedule, and um, uh, things aren't working. We have to rewrite on the set. So the puppeteers are very helpful at that, and everybody collaborates on making that happen. So they they contribute. You told me one time that you thought 95% of the creative process is done at casting. Can you expound on that? Well, I think it uh, relates to film, and that's not my quote. That's a quote that comes from, um, um, well, actually, you know, several people have said it, evidently, but um, I heard it from Robert Altman, who's the, uh, uh, he passed away a while ago, and he um, he was the director of Nashville. Uh, he uh, directed the 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 first and still the quintessential version, I think, of MASH. Incredible director. and uh, But he said that uh, he believed that for the director, because of the nature of film, it's different than theater. You often don't get a chance to really rehearse a character or rehearse a script with your cast. So it is very, very important that you make the correct decisions. And he felt that 95%, he used that, that number of his real creative work was done at casting. And if he and if he failed at that, he felt the film would be a failure. And I agree with that. I think that when you're shooting film, we generally or television, actually even particularly television, you oftentimes don't have enough time to rehearse. So who you put in those roles is very, very important. They have to have a almost a symbiotic relationship with the writer. They have to know that they understand who the characters are, and uh, and and then they have to know how how to bring the, their own personalities through in that into that character. It's very, very difficult work. Uh, and there's you know we have we have a we have a lot of actors in this country that make it look very easy, but it's uh, it's not. And any actor will tell you that it's not. It takes a lot of love of hard work and a lot of a lot of pre-work to be ready so when you're interviewing when you're casting when you're getting people to read um for the part you know you have to be thorough and you have to be very careful and you have to also know what you're looking for or who you're looking for and, and, and the type of person you want to do it and that's that takes a lot of work and a lot of research on your part, and um, and you have to make right decisions. So yeah, I, I do agree with that, and uh, and I found that my entire career, uh, it's very very important, very important. So you personally have been involved in the casting process in the past? Oh sure, oh sure. I mean, all the kids shows do casting for other characters, and I, I honestly think, and I. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite casting decision was on a um, on a woman who uh, had to play a special character on a direct to video a home video that I did at the Barney show and she was uh, she was playing a character called Mother Nature and she had a very very unique quality that um, I had never thought about the character in that light before but when she did her reading uh, she I didn't have any I didn't really feel the need to even see anyone else she was my top choice and I remember I had to fight for her I, I know that not everybody agreed. Uh, she's a wonderful voiceover actress down in uh, Dallas area. Actually, she just worked with me recently on another project out of uh, Michigan, Charlie and Company, where she she did a voice of an animated character. But that's a, that's an instant where I I felt she made the entire film. I felt that she was so important, playing the character the way she did and reading the way she did. Even the voice she has is perfect, just perfect. So yeah, I was I was pretty pleased, pretty pleased with myself and pretty pleased uh, that I fought for her and pretty pleased that she was accepted and then and then marveled at by everybody else later. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it, and it comes up all the time. It comes up in all kinds of things, actually, in, in whether it be film or television or, or anything you do. You know, who you pick is often, it's a monstrous decision, but it's very, very important, so...
So here, here's a question that sprang up just today when I was driving back from lunch. Uh, obviously, with the NFL draft coming up, there's a bunch of debate on do you take the particular area that you're looking for or do you take the best available talent in the draft? When, when somebody is casting, are they looking for a certain particular thing that whoever wrote the screenplay or the script, they've, they, they've got a vision for something? And they want somebody to come in to fit their vision? Or are they just wanting to, whoever the most talented person shows up, if they're blonde and they should have been brunette, it, you know, it doesn't matter? Yeah, both, actually. You know, you just don't know what you're going to run into. Sometimes you have a vision. Sometimes, and in, in the case of Mother Nature, I really didn't have a vision. So I was reliant on, um, you know, the actors bringing their own vision to the uh, to the character, which is kind of what you want because again there's not enough time to really work through it so but either or i don't think there's a correct way i think it just depends on on how you work i like to see what a person brings to the character but again some characters are written in such a way they're so specific that um you know you know what you're looking for and that that uh I find that a little bit problematic for me because I think it's sometimes if I, uh, it makes me, you know, kind of the Lord and master of this material. And I feel like, um, uh, I want to be open to see an actor's interpretation. It's back to the same old thing again, where you're working with a lot of very good people and they are just as creative as you are and just as uh, visionary as you are. And they can interpret scripts just like you can. And so yeah, I like to be open to uh, another kind of read. Have I been swayed? Yeah, definitely. I've been swayed more often than not by ha having a vision myself and then having somebody come in and read and change that vision. That's great. That's part of what we do. That's why it's fun. That's why it's exciting for me. Some people it's not, you know, and I, I don't speak for all directors, uh, not, you know, not on the least, but sometimes people come in and they do it differently and you love it. And, uh, and yeah, I like to be open to that. I've been on numerous film and television show sets, and I know from the general public, we see movie stars, film stars, TV stars, and you sort of think that because they're the star, they're the alpha dog on the thing, and then you get on set, and you realize they're just taking direction like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Who's the top yeah. Who's the top dog on the set? Oh, boy. You know, it really varies. I mean, the way you described it sometimes does happen that way. Uh, but on a film set, generally the director is top dog. Um, on a television set, although the, there is a director, and this is true in, um, this is true for, you know, all of the, the series that you're seeing now that we all binge watch, you know, like uh, Walking Dead and uh, uh, Mad Men and um, Breaking Bad and, you know, everything else that's out there. They are generally the, the executive producer or the showrunner who created the idea, they're generally the top dog, top dog. Because what they've done is they've pretty much woven this entire story in their heads and they've written it down. And they've, uh, they oftentimes have written the pilot script. So they know exactly what they're looking for. So the director on the set of film is a little bit different. That person is generally coming in with the same kind of authority um, that the showrunner does in television. You know, why is it different? Probably because the showrunner has a little bit, uh, they, they usually have to have a lot less time to shoot in. So they have to be pretty crisp. They have to move quickly. And, and if, uh, if somebody's not getting it, then he's going to be the best person to make it right. I'm sure a lot of, again, directors will take exception with that, but I've seen it happen on sets where the executive producer will, you know, has to step in and say, no, the scene should be this way. Um, and they're they're much more involved, and that's why they get the title, which is kind of a, a title a lot of people don't know, but it's uh, they're called showrunners. They run the show. They're responsible for every single aspect of the program, creatively, administratively, financially, everything. So that's in television, film. You can have a director in that kind of position. Oftentimes, directors will end up being producers. There's also director writers who, um, you know, and every director includes all the team around him in, in process differently. You know, so there's a lot of different scenarios. But generally, the director is seen as the, uh, you know, the head person on set. Is there a difference between a producer and an executive? executive producer yes 
Again, it varies. It varies, you know, I mean, in television, if you watch the credits of some of these shows, there's multiple executive producers, there's multiple producers, and they all do different things. Some of them supervise the writers. Uh, some of them, actually, I think you get a, if you're one of the writers in a show, you can get a credit as a, as a producer. So it just depends on the, on the way the show is structured. Um, there's a lot of different kind of executive producer usually denotes somebody who's in charge of a, of a large portion of the production or, or of the entire production. Uh, however, um, I remember um, Ray Romano on his show, Everybody Loves Raymond, one of the executive producers was his manager. Um, so all his manager was really responsible for was Ray. So, you know, the, so that's a title that's kind of, sometimes it means a lot, sometimes it means less, but it's, uh, it's a coveted uh, title in television. On film, the executive producers are really responsible for organizing the whole thing. So they're, you know, either raising the money or, or um, in, you know, in, uh, in putting the whole team together. It's a, it's a little, they're they're more outside the creative process. But you know, it just depends. It changes all the time. It's ever changing. Even television is, has changed dramatically over the last ten, fifteen years. They actually changed dramatically over the last uh, over the last five years. So I hope that's clear. It's a little bit, it's still a little bit fuzzy, but uh, unfortunately, the industry keeps it fuzzy. Oh, it's more clear so. for me than it was five minutes ago. Okay, that's helpful. Sure. Perfect. <laughs> so for you, uh, you do Sesame Street and Barney. Those are that seems like a natural progression one to the other. How do you get to either one of those from Bill Maher, politically incorrect? You know, I just, again, it's a process. I am I love doing children's programming. I have an affinity for it. I'm good at it. You know, I've been I've been nominated for six Emmys for children's program and then I've won uh, uh, an Emmy as a director for Sesame Street. So it's it's my sweet spot. But I also like doing other things and I'm, I'm uh, I've always liked doing other things. So I will, you know, I did a great talk show years ago on MSNBC with John Hockenberry, the journalist, and that was one of the most fun shows I've ever done. We had music and talk, and we made short films, and it was really interesting. Politically incorrect, I mean, who wouldn't want to work on a show like that? It was hilarious. It brought together the strangest combination of people uh, every single week. And when I was when when it was in production, I was doing uh, you know four shows a week, and um, it was a gargantuan task to take on because the booking of it was just uh, you know huge. It was hugely difficult, you know, because we wanted to get we always wanted that mix. We wanted to get a writer. We wanted to get a, a comedian. We wanted to get a big star. We wanted to get a politician. So that way it was a bear to do that show, but I really, really enjoyed that um, that process. Uh, I've done documentaries inside prisons for um, MSNBC, um, which is um, a whole other kind of experience. But ultimately, in some way, we're all trying to tell stories and we're trying to um, communicate something, you know, and that, that manifests itself in different ways into different audiences, but the process is always a thrill. And actually, you know, as an artist, I like working in a lot of different areas because I like to have a lot of different experiences. And um, then that's, that's why I do that. When you're not working on a specific project, do you have, and whether it's you know a notebook or a laptop or something where you just jot down ideas and possibilities? Yeah, I do. I mean, I have a suspense file, which is is again, um, I, I think it's a common term, but if, for those who don't know it, it's a, it's just a file that you look in maybe every six months. And you look at the things that you wanted to do and haven't done, and it's it's actually you generally forget, and so it's uh, it, it's kind of like a moment of suspense when you open it up. Um, yeah, sure, absolutely, absolutely. I've always tried to uh, keep track of projects that never get off the ground, um, even if they're even if all I've written down is a little concept on a napkin. I do I do know of a story in uh, uh, several stories in L.A. where you know. People will at a meeting will write have written down the concepts on, uh, on a napkin and had another person you know write a check for twenty twenty five thousand dollars just for the napkin, hmm. um, which blows my mind. But it it has happened. You know these things happen in in that business. Uh, where where an idea like that at a, in a very early stage can be kind of planted in some uh, writer's mind and then they they just write a script. 
When you're in between projects, do you have any kind of daily regimen or ritual you do to keep the game up, stay sharp? Oh, no, no. Balance. I try to keep a balanced life. I really, you know, I, I would I would say that one of the wonderful things about my time living in New York, I've lived in New York and L.A., and now I live in Nashville. The great thing about living in New York is that I had a lot of friends who worked in different businesses, and that I found um, very, very balancing. It was, it, it's, it, in L.A., it's much different where you end up associating and socializing with people, I should say, in uh, pretty much all of us who are either in the business or want to be in the business. But I found, uh, for me at least, uh, New York was a much more balanced atmosphere because I met, I, you know, I, I ran around people who were investment bankers or teachers or, or lawyers or whatever. They weren't all mired in the business. And that that's refreshing. And that time in between projects where you're around people uh, all the time who are working with you, that really gives you some rest and relaxation, but it also keeps you sharp because you're hearing different perceptions and ideas from a whole different group of people. And that's great. That's somebody, that's something I would encourage everyone to do, uh, regardless of, of what they do. It's, it's always good to kind of get out of yourself and hang out with a group of people that you don't hang out with much and, and just get some fresh perspectives on things. And that's one of the things I wanted to ask you. You've sort of been the alpha dog on a bunch of different sets. So you could give advice to a whole bunch of different parts of the cast there. Like, I'm sure you've got advice for writers, advice for actors. Mm -hmm. what, what, would, what would your advice be to somebody who wanted to write on a hit TV show? Wow. Well, writing is the most, I, you know, I have a great admiration for writers and I think writers are the really, you know, I mean, that's the hardest thing. I mean, we still watch uh, movies and we still see TV that's poorly written and we know it's poorly written because it's not very funny. It's not this, it's not engaging. It's not, it's not uh, pulling you into the characters, you know, and so there's still bad writing out there. I think the primary advice is write as much as you can and read as much as you can. I think that if you want to be a playwright, read plays. If you want to be a screenwriter, read screenplays. I mean, you can get screenplays free online, easy to read. It's like, uh, it's like just simple um, and it doesn't cost anything. So I think that's a great way to learn. There's also several books and teachers in, in, in both screenwriting and playwriting that are out there and I won't, I won't recommend them, but there's, there's dozens of them and they're good. They're really good and they, they help give you a context. But, I, but experientially, I think it's great to read movies, read scripts, go to movies, read plays, go to plays, um, you know, read television scripts, watch television. I mean, that's the only way you're going to, you're going to really understand what happens from moment to moment in a script. Then you need to start writing and writing is a muscle. It's like every, anything else, the, the less you do it, the, you know, you, you get a little weak. Now, again, sometimes you need a break from it, but, um, I think writers, the really good writers, write constantly. So that's 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 a just something that's easy to say, harder to do. Write constantly. So same question, but apply to actors. Well, acting is a. Uh, it just depends. It depends on where you want to act. You know, there's also different systems of acting. There's method acting. There's a. Uh, you know, I talk about this a lot. Where you have a. You have a, a clash between method acting and, and uh, you know, overseas, for example, the script is very sacred. And, uh, you know, you want to come into a first day rehearsal off book, knowing your lines. And and, uh, and then you can start to work the character in it. You know, they try to work the character that way. Whereas in America, a method actor might want to go out and do something experientially and try to uh, understand some other things or get in a physical state or before, you know, you, I mean, the, the great story comes out of, you know, is Laurence Olivier and um, Dustin Hoffman. We would agree to extraordinary actors, but both 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 worked differently in their in their careers so there's no right way either there's you know you can make it work but at any rate Dustin at the time was a uh, method actor and Laurence Olivier is is very very was a very very strict British actor who you know read the script and and felt that the the script was sacred you know if things needed to be changed and process fine but come in knowing the script the truth is in the script 
without giving the film away, uh, Olivier plays a, a Nazi doctor. Um, this is after the war, but a Nazi doctor, and he's a dentist. It's a little late. For, yeah, you don't have to worry about spoilers at this point. Okay, well, he's a, he's a, he's a, den- he's a dentist, and, and he's torturing Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman comes in, and uh, he, is, he was out all night, you know, kind of carousing around and, and starving himself and just trying to get into the shape of a character who had been tortured. And he walks on set and Olivier looks at him and he says, my goodness, you look awful. Are you okay? And he and Dustin Hoffman says, you know, I was, I was just, you know, I, I wanted to get ready for today's scene. And Olivier looks at him and he says, my dear boy, why don't you just try acting? <laughs> That's beautiful, um, yeah. and and that's a that's an old story, and it's true. But that would be the version from the from across the pond as to how you should approach it: read the script, and then be an actor, and act it, perform it. You know, pretend. <laughs> but you know, Hoffman had to get into the exact condition, and that's how he worked. That's how he needed to work. And you want to really find the process, and this is a long way to give this advice. You want to find the acting process that that works that works for who you are as a human being. You want to, just like film and, th- and theater, and, and you want to study the people, the characters, the actors that, that you admire. Why are they good? Why are their moments the best moments there are? And how do they, how do they perform their, their, their skill? And how do they take the task of being in a movie and being a character? How do they, how do they deal with that? What do they do well? Because ultimately they have to perform in that moment when that you're on set and somebody yells action. Theater, it's a little different, but all these, all these different disciplines have different prophecies. Uh, some people act, in, act on stage and that's all they'll ever do. And that's all they want to do. And that's, that's wonderful. It's got its own process. So you have to learn the, the different processes for being an actor, the different, the different systems. You have to find out what's good for you. What do you, what do you think you can excel at? And then, and then you have to work at it. You have to be present. You have to be involved. You have to be submerged. Um, acting is hard. You know, again, when I first started uh, doing um, narrative or scripted work, I studied acting for a year and I was completely awful at it. But I learned about process. And um, I learned about the different processes that go into a character and that go that can go into an actor. And when they're getting ready for a role, I learned how to read a script. So there's that thing again, read scripts, read scripts over and over and over again. And there are great schools for, for acting right now, for theater. Consider that because they there there's a huge amount of people that go to school and then there's a huge amount of people that don't. But some of your best actors were you know were professionally trained that way. So you want to look into that also. Is there something that you can use to sort of hone or develop your skill by yourself? Like if I want to you know shoot baskets, I can go out in my backyard by myself and you know check up some shots. What what can you do to work on your acting at home alone? Well, you know you're not going to be able to do that alone until you get it completely on your own because you have to. Acting is like everything else that I do. It's you're you're with a group of people, so you have to learn to play with people. You know, it's not just doing a monologue you have to be able to play in the moment with what's going on in any moment in any play whether you're alive on stage or you're doing a, a you know a 30 second scene for a film you have to be in that moment and you have to be able to perform in that environment and that's uh that just can't be completely duplicated at home. I really just really encourage, no matter where you live, no matter where you are, get involved with a theater company. Go take a class. That's really the way to do it. And these are these are collaborative mediums. You have to go get out there with people and see what other people's processes. Work with other people. Get advice. Get encouragement. Oftentimes, just to get encouragement and support is, is a lot. So you gotta you gotta get out there. You you can't stay at home. You know the only person that has to stay home alone, and even they have writers groups. Are writers? You know, um, writers generally. It's a solemn, lonely process. What are you watching for fun these days? And then what kind of stuff do you watch sort of for inspiration to get tips, learn tricks? Like who do you look up to? You know, I have um, I have favorite filmmakers from different eras. I mean, I, it's hard to pinpoint one. I love the, 
you know, a, a lot of Woody Allen's work, especially back in the 70s. I thought he did some incredible work in the 70s. You know, today, I love this new guy, Urutu, who just did uh, Revenant and um, uh, The Revenant, and he did uh, Birdman, and he's from Mexico, and he's, like, uh, on another planet, as far as I'm concerned. He's, he's taken two films and been unconventional in both of them in a different way. See, now, that, there's a question for him. You know, how come you work in these two completely different genres well you know they're stories and that's that's what's consistent about both of them one is an adaption from a book i don't know what, where birdman came from it may be an adaption also but it's a completely different kind of story and tone and timing and place but um he's just been brilliant in both of them uh, as a director. So this is a guy that I'm really watching carefully because I, I see a lot of new tricks. I mean, Christopher Nolan, whether his films don't always read great to me, uh, most of them are, um, but boy, when he hits it, he hits it, he smashes it. You know, and I think anybody who's a, who's a new fan of uh, Christopher Nolan should go back and watch uh, Memento, which is still one of the That's most- That's a great one, yep. Starting, it's one of the most startling films I've ever seen in my life. I, I don't know if I was ready for a film like that when I when I turned it on. It was just so extraordinary. So that guy's got a lot of stuff, and all he's and he's also very good. Uh, I like <laughs> here's, a, here's a name from the. I like Baz Luhrmann who did um, Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge was a musical with amazing performances by Nicole Kidman and Owen McGregor and everybody else who was in it. Uh, I, I remember that film uh, at one point at the beginning, just saying to myself, what am I watching here? This is amazing. And it was a musical, and it and it and it, and it, and it had these different arrangements of, of popular songs. It just was ast astonishing. So, you know, and he hasn't always hit the mark either, but, you know, he's a guy that is somebody I always like to watch. And then there's the smaller filmmakers I like. Like, how do you do that? like that how do you do that on a budget um like wes anderson and but it's those kinds of uh, people who do it on the budget that are just remarkable folks like that you know you know the king's speech was made for 10 million dollars and that was directed by a young man who came out of television and in england and uh of course the next film he did was that just another astonishing musical version of uh les mis and you think to yourself, well, how does he go from, you know, doing a film like uh, The King's Speech to a film like Les Mis? And then you, you think about Aratu and going from, you know, Birdman to The Revenant. So uh, they're all stories and they're, they're different and they're told in completely different styles, completely different styles. That's exciting. That's exciting, and that's I've always wanted to be more like that, and I, I've always tried to do new things, and I don't, I don't want to have a style, you know, I don't want to have a style that people look at and go, oh, it's Steve again, you know, I'd like to do, I like to do things, do different genres and do things differently. These are much more extreme examples uh, than what I do, but um, you know, they're amazing, amazing artists. If all the stars align and the universe conspires to aid you, what are you doing in five years? Wow. Well, you know, I have a, what's, what's, what might be easier to say is that I currently have, uh, I'm working on three films in development, and they're very early in development. Actually, two are early in development, and one has been in development for 15 years. <laughs> so what I'd really like to do is I'd like to finish all of them in, within five years. And then, and I may do this sooner, I would really like to just spend my time teaching and I would like to be able to teach in a situation where I can have the freedom to make a couple of short films every year that would be just fine for me I would love that what do, what do you want to teach is it writing or directing or acting I like to teach the entire industry I mean I don't teach writing I'm not I'm not because uh, I hate writing I just hate it uh, with a passion because I'm 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 a I got into this part of the business because I'm I'm social and I like to be around people all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm weak that way, <laughs> but I enjoy it. And I enjoy teaching because of that. And uh, I also, um, you know, I would probably teach, uh, looking forward to teaching this fall, a, a course in directing and also a course in, uh, in visual storytelling. Yeah, I mean, those are, the, those are the areas that I'm strongest in. I'm not particularly technical, although I do have some technical skills, 
I started as an editor. But I think uh, that's it. That's what I like to teach. I like to teach all the entire process producing. You know, we have a lot of structures in this business that can that have been made simple or simpler, and it's important to keep up with it and walk in uh, right out of school, kind of knowing how to do it. And that would be important. And then I'd love to see I'd love to see um, my students do well. And that would be that would be maybe five years beyond the five years. If you could look back in time 20, 30 years ago at a younger version of yourself and younger you wanted to be where older you is, what one piece of advice would you give him to make sure he stayed on the path? Well, know yourself. You know, you got to know yourself. I mean, I, I have quoted many times, again, to all those listeners who may have heard me before. Uh, you may have heard this before, but uh, there's a, a great line in Spanglish, the um, film years ago with Adam Sandler. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, I'm going to quote an Adam Sandler film. Is everybody ready? Um, and lay it on us. Okay, the line is very simple. You know, uh, sometimes low self-esteem is just good common sense. So um, know yourself and and try to be in the, as in touch with your skill and your skill level as you possibly be, can be. I always want to encourage people to chase their dreams, but make sure your dreams are rooted in some way in your personality, not necessarily in circumstances, but in your personality, make sure they're rooted in a reality. And we learn this throughout our whole lives. So, but that's where you want to always have your focus. Am I up to this? Is this something I can do and do with excellence? And so the bottom line here is be honest with yourself. Um, And to me, that's the most important thing anybody can do in their lives, you know, day to day. Be honest with yourself, know what your limitations are. And if you're not good at something that you really believe that you want, but find out you're not good at it, then have the good common sense to recognize that, mourn it if you need to, but then move on. That's actually really good advice, and I think it ties in a little bit to the follow-up question, which is what single cautionary tale would you tell someone who wanted to follow in your footsteps? Same thing. Yeah, that's that's what it sounded like. Don't. Yeah, I mean, don't lie about yourself. Don't uh, because if you if you do, here's a, a, you know, in getting a job, this is the biggest you know white lie I ever told. Okay, my first really big job in television, I was up to be a producer and a director for South Carolina Public Television. I was in my mid twenties, so it was a fairly big job for someone who was that young. And I went in, and they said to me, "Can you direct a nightly news show?" And notice they didn't ask me if I'd ever directed a nightly news show. They asked me if I could direct one. If you could. And I, and I, yes. I got my first piano job that way in college. There you go. <laughs> so that's it. So I answered yes, I can. Could you uh, edit, write, and direct a children's uh, science and art series? And I said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I could do that. And, you know, I didn't know that I could do it. But, but something inside of me believed that I did have that capability. And fortunately, it worked out for me, you know. So just um, you need to be bold. And I think when you're honest with yourself, it's easier to be confident in front of others. It's much easier to do that if, you're, if you really do believe um, that you know yourself and you can deliver. And if you can't deliver, then know that at least for the time being, that this is something you cannot do and then make a decision. But um, it, to me, the, the, that's the same thing. It's the same thing, you know, to respond to your question. It's exactly the same answer. Looking back at your career, can you pinpoint or do you have any memorable ego deflating moments? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, every time you're not hired to do something that you're up for, it's ego deflating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, any time you, you fail at getting a gig... Or you fail at a gig because you may have made a mistake. Maybe you thought you knew yourself better. Yeah, it's it's deflating. But every deflating moment should be a learning moment. And if it's not, then what the lesson is to learn is that you just have to grieve the moment and then move on. You cannot uh, you cannot get mired down in it. So yeah, I've had disappointments. I've had jobs that I didn't get. I remember moving to LA because I wanted to do a certain kind of work, and then I got to LA, and all that kind of work was being being sent to Canada because they had tax incentives. So I suddenly found myself. Uh, I moved my whole family to Los Angeles, and there wasn't enough of the kind of work that I'd gone there to get around. So 
so that was just a blow. That was a blow to my in my my sense of making a good decision. That was a a blow to my abilities, and I, I just you know felt awful about it. But you know, ultimately, you're in the moment. You got to stay in the moment, and in the moment, it dictates. Well, I got a family, got to make a living, so you got to go out and do what you got to do. Period. But that was a uh, L.A. was a harsh experience for me. It was a very harsh experience for me because of that of not being able, I went out there specifically to to get more focused in some other directions and it didn't work out. So, you know, in retrospect, did I make a mistake? Uh, Yeah, you could say so. You could say that I made a big mistake in doing that, but it worked out. It worked out. You're just going to hang in there and move forward. And that's just what you got to do. That's life. That's life. (laughs) Those are all the tough questions I've got for you. The rest of them are going to be super, super easy. But before we uh, launch into the final questions, are there any like final parting thoughts or insider anecdotes? Or if somebody puts you on the spot and said, tell us one of your most entertaining tales from the industry. You know, I don't have much to say beyond what I've said. I mean, the uh, Christmas parties at Sesame Street. Uh, I'll tell you, and again, this, they're both with Sesame Street. I had two extraordinary experiences with celebrities that really, to this day, here's an anecdote. Okay, here's an anecdote that actually speaks to a lot of the questions that I've always loved. Um, I did this uh, music video on Sesame Street with R.E.M., one of my favorite bands. They come in in the morning, and I find myself in studio laying down track with them. I'm not singing, but I'm there in, in the stu- in the recording studio. So that in itself was like, whoa, fun. It was really fun. Um, but more fun than that was that um, we were doing a uh, parody off their old song, Shiny Happy People. And um, there's, a, there's a, a female singer who sings with the B-52s, Kate Pearson, who was one of the backup singers in that, but she had a very distinctive voice and a very distinctive part in the in the harmonies and so um i I, we asked her if she would join the session and she couldn't so then i we asked her would would you mind if we made a a puppet version of you and of course kate has this shock of red hair and uh and so we made this red-headed puppet well the woman who was chosen uh, to sing that part was a woman named Stephanie D'Ambrosio. And I'll never forget this because this was like such a high moment for her in her career because she was uh, on the second, more of the second uh, rung of puppeteers at the time there. And uh, the Sesame Street has mostly male puppeteers anyway. There aren't many female characters, although that's changed quite a bit over the years. So Stephanie had this opportunity to lay down tracks with R.E.M., and I'll never forget her just, first of all, she blew it away. She just, I mean, it was amazing, her work. Um, it was perfect. It was like such a great invitation, but but just wonderful. And they were all impressed with her. And, and so we all felt good about having Stephanie there. And the real fun thing about the business, and I, I love telling this story because a few years later, Stephanie ended up in the Broadway version of Avenue Q. And she won a Tony Award for her role in Avenue Q. And that to me was, was just, I look at her, at her those set of two experiences in her life and how it ultimately led to her having more of a leading role in something and being honored in that fashion. And I just, I, I love that. It's one of my favorite personal entertainment stories that I, I just love telling and was in New York the whole time when it happened. It was just, it was just exciting. So I've always, I've always enjoyed that. Stephanie, out to you if you're listening. Mm. All right. We've come to the end here. You ready? I'm ready. What animal would I be if I could be any animal? Yeah, and we're going to have you mime it, too, because that makes great radio. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm doing it right now. If your job only paid the bills and not a penny more than that, would you still continue to do it? Yes. What talent or skill do you not have that you wish you did? I wish I were a writer. Fill in the blank. I am a success if I... If I've influenced the people that I work with in a positive way. And conversely, I am a failure if I... If I don't succeed in... It's the same thing. It's the same thing in reverse. I mean, I I don't... If if I fail to build relationship with the project and with the the people on the set, then I feel like I failed. What is the single best piece of advice that you follow to get where you are today? Listen. 
What piece of advice are you glad you ignored to get where you are today? Don't be overconfident just to get the job. I mean, it's the self it's the self worth issue again. Don't value yourself too much. I mean, and that's a delicate thing because we do need to value ourselves, but don't value yourself too much. much. Because I think a lot of people have advised me to um, that you're great. Don't worry about it. No, no, you're you're you you're, you may not be great. You you may be this, but you're not great. Keep your own, uh, uh, so it's the opposite of keep your own skills in perspective. Don't overestimate yourself. What character trait do you like best about yourself? That I love people, and I got that from my dad. What character trait do you like least about yourself? (laughs) That I have to be with people all the time. (laughs) Steve, are you codependent? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Fill in the blank. Yes. I believe every child should have the opportunity to... Create. If you could suggest one piece of self-improvement that everyone on Earth would adopt, what would it be? Listen and ask questions. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? I would love to leap a tall building in a single bound and not be afraid of heights. If you could have dinner with anyone alive or dead, who would it be? Jesus. An hospitable nearby planet has been discovered and you have been recruited to help colonize it. You may take any three items with you that you wish. What are they? I would take my guitar. I would take a uh, instrument to write with. And I would take an instrument to draw pictures with. All right. And the last question. You have just won a Lifetime Achievement Award. Give us your acceptance speech. Uh, There won't be any music to cue you off the stage so you can get to all of the thank yous that you need or if there's a personal cause you you want to champion and you feel very strongly about, this is your time. Well, it's very simple. I'd I'd like to thank God with putting me into a situation where I could enjoy myself at my work and that I could impact people and particularly impact children the way I've been able to. Uh, this this by itself, if my career ended tomorrow, uh, would be sufficient. All right, Mr. Feldman, you're off the hot seat. That's all I got for you. Is that That's it? it. That was wonderfully done, sir. I can't wait to hear the, all the whole series. All right, Steve, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure having you here. I thoroughly enjoyed that. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. We will be in touch. Talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Once again, that was Emmy-winning director and producer Steve Feldman. I'd like to thank everyone for joining me today. You are listening to the Live to Create podcast, and this is Shane Ongren reminding you to dream big, be inspired, and live creatively.